I'm Dr. DeBusk, and in this video, I'm going to talk about the function and types of roots. Most roots have three main functions. One, anchoring the plant firmly to a substrate. Two, absorbing water and minerals. And three, producing hormones. Firm anchoring provides stability and is important in virtually all plants. Without proper root attachment, trees and shrubs cannot remain upright, and epiphytes like this anthurium would be blown from their sites in the tree canopy. Although roots like leaves have an absorptive function, the two organs have totally different shapes. Its cylindrical shape allows all sides to have the same absorptive capacity. Roots have a higher surface to volume ratio, ideal for absorption of water and nutrients. Roots are also quite active in the production of several hormones. Shoot growth and development depend on the hormones cytokinin and gibberellin imported from the roots. Another common function is carbohydrate storage with fleshy taproots such as radishes. Most seed plants have a single large taproot that develops from the radical, an embryonic root. Numerous small lateral roots or branch roots are coming out of it, as you can see in this tobacco seedling. Lateral roots may also produce even more lateral roots, resulting in a highly branched root system. These are a mass of many similarly sized roots that are adventitious in nature. Adventitious roots do not arise on pre-existing roots or from the radical. These increase the absorptive and transport capacities. Quorum of the gladiolus, like other monocots, have a fibrous root system. The radical died shortly after germination. No root here has developed from the radical. As the gladiolus continues to grow, it will produce more roots, each independent of the others. Many eudicots undergo secondary growth. This increases the amount of wood, xylem, in both the trunk and the roots, allowing more leaves to grow and a more extensive root system. Most monocots cannot undergo secondary growth. After the stem is formed, their conducting capacity cannot be increased, as you can see with this younger and older palm. An ever-increasing taproot system would not work here. Formation of adventitious roots can overcome this limitation. No part of the monocot stem needs to conduct all the water from all the roots to all the leaves and flowers, as does the trunk of a woody plant. The ability to form adventitious roots is not limited to monocots. Many eudicots produce rhizomes or stolons also grow this way. Also, many eudicots that never produce adventitious roots in nature do so if they are cut. This is important in the process of asexual propagation by cuttings. The type of roots just described are the most common generalized type comprising some or all of the roots of most plants and other species some roots are modified and carry out different roles in the plant's survival. Storage roots provide long-term storage for carbohydrates that accumulate during summer photosynthesis. In biennial plants that live for two years, such as beets, carrots, celery, and many perennials like datura, phlox, and daisies, roots are the only permanent organs. Those carbohydrates stored are used to produce a new shoot in the spring or a tasty meal for us. Biannuals and perennials store nutrients during the winter. Some advantages include that the roots are less visible as food for foragers, and the roots environment is more stable than its above ground parts. Prop roots are adventitious roots that grow extensively through the air. They provide extra absorptive capacity and extra stability, as in this small palm. It braces them against wind and water currents. It's common in monocots such as palms and corn, but also in eudicots such as this banyan tree. Roots of certain tropical trees become tall, plate-like buttress roots like this ficus. In mangroves, the prop roots are selectively advantageous for other reasons. At high tide, the roots are flooded with ocean water. Saltwater pulls water out of the most terrestrial plants and animals. Mangrove roots survive these conditions because their surface tissues keep salt water away from the delicate cells inside the root, and they have a ranchyma that lets oxygen diffuse into the root from the shoots. Many orchids are epiphytic, living attached to the branches of trees. Their roots spread along the surface of bark and often dangle freely in the air. Aerial roots of orchids have a specialized epidermis called a vellum. 
the waterproof velamen prevents water loss if the air becomes dry. In oxalis, gladiolus, crinum, and other plants with bulbs, roots undergo even more contraction than prop roots do. After extending through the soil and becoming firmly anchored, the uppermost portions slowly contract, burying the bulb farther down. Contractile roots are important for stability and depth control. Root contraction may be important in anchoring new germinated seeds, and bulbs and corms use contractile roots to change their depth in the soil. Roots of most seed plants, at least 80%, have a symbiotic relationship with soil fungi, mycorrhizae, in which both organisms benefit. The fungi gain carbohydrates from the roots and the fungal hyphae aid in phosphorus and water uptake. In nearly all woody forest plants, an ectomycorrhizal relationship exists in which fungal hyphae penetrate the outermost root cortex cells but never invade the cells themselves. Herbaceous plant have an endomycorrhizal association in which fungal hyphae penetrate the root cortex and cell walls as far as the endodermis. They do not break the host plasma membrane or vacuole membrane. The plant cells lack starch grains because they're transferring them to the fungus. The fungus is unable to live without these sugars and often the plant becomes stunted without the fungus, probably due to phosphorus deficiency. Let's see how endomycorrhizae works. First, the spore of the mycorrhizae fungi germinate in the soil and make their way to the nearest roots. The roots are then colonized by the fungi and mycorrhizae are established. The fungi penetrate the root and create an internal network of fungal structures inside the root cells, called an arbuscule, where the plant and mycorrhizae exchange sugars and nutrients. Finally, the hyphae continue to develop outside the roots forming an extended network of fine filaments which cover up to 700 times more soil area than the plant's own roots. This secondary root system draws in the extra beneficial nutrients and water supporting a plant or tree for its entire lifetime. For most plants, the scarcity of nitrogenous compounds in the soil is a growth limiting factor. In a small number of plants, especially legumes, a symbiotic relationship has evolved with nitrogen-fixing bacteria of the genus Rhizobium. Rhizobium infects the host root hair. It triggers the cells of the cortex to divide and produce a root nodule. Rhizobium gets an oxygen-free atmosphere and sugars, and the legume gets nitrogenous compounds. A number of angiosperms are parasites on other plants. Because their substrate is the body of another plant, a normal root system would not penetrate the host or absorb materials from it effectively. Hostoria are highly modified roots of parasitic plants. Hostorial roots are modified to attach the parasite to the host and penetrate the host vascular tissue. The hostoria penetrates the epidermis and cortex, then continues until it makes contact with the host's xylem. This photo shows a transverse section of a branch of a juniper being attacked by the hostorium of a mistletoe. This photo shows daughter and its hostorium. A continuous vessel from host to parasite forms constructed of cells of both. The parasites only attack the xylem photosynthesize. Others that don't photosynthesize also attack the phloem. This tree in the Everglades is encased in the roots of a strangler fig. The large branch of the fig at the upper left is actually the trunk of the fig where the seed germinated. Many mistake this as a vine, but if it was, there would be large leafy branches emerging from many areas. This concludes this section on functions and types of roots.